see you all. For the opening words this morning, I'd like to share a piece written by my colleague, the Reverend Alicia Ford. Alicia works for a UUA headquarters and identifies as an African descent queer cisgender female with deep roots in Tobago. <laughs> These are her words when we pause to remember. When we pause to remember who we are, companions on this grand experiment called life, when we take a moment to shed the ways we've been carefully taught to lead from fear, punish the poor, persecute those who don't look like we do, and deny rights to those who love, to believe we are separate, that some people are superior to others, when we take a moment to shed all of that and hear our stories, hear and see each other into existence, into community, when we take a moment to embrace to practice a different way of being. When we answer the call of love, then we are living into the promise of building the world we dream about. It's beautiful to dream, to cast a vision, to stretch our minds into the future and imagine what may be if we were to build a new way of being. Not someday, but beginning again today, beginning again every day that we have breath, Taking courage with these hands and hearts to make real the dream of a more equitable world. To journey together, seeking to be transformed even as we transform. Becoming explorers and learners in this world around us, humbled by what we do not yet know. Fulfilling the promise of healing, a fragmented world. Laboring not just in hope, but also in love. In this spirit, we commit. In this spirit, we pray. In this spirit, we gather. So here's some parts of the story that I didn't share with the kids. These are the three men who were arrested and tried for the murder of James Reed. Their names are William and Naaman Hoggle and Stanley Cook. A fourth man, R.B. Kelly, was indicted but fled to Mississippi and the government there chose not to return him for trial. These three men were found not guilty. This is in spite of eyewitness testimony, including that of the two ministers who were with James Reed that night, my colleagues Clark Olson and Orloff Miller. This in spite of the fact that pretty much all of the white folks in town, including the 12 white men who were seated on the jury, knew that these three guys were the ones who had participated in the attack. But they were found not guilty, and that was that. For 50 years, the murder of James Reed was considered a cold case. Then, two young journalists from NPR, Andrew Grace and Chip Brantley, decided to investigate this cold case. They broadcasted their findings in a podcast called White Lies that came out just last year. I recommend it highly, and I'm going to try and not do too many spoilers, because I'm really hoping that you'll listen to it yourselves. Um, suffice it to say that they do get to the bottom of how and why the jury reached the verdict. And they also confirmed that these three defendants were, in fact, guilty of committing the crime. They even found the fourth attacker, who essentially, the only one still alive, um, who essentially confessed to them that he had been involved. I'm not going to tell you his name. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you his name, but it wasn't Harvey Kelly. In the process, they came to understand how it was that an entire town became complicit in a cover-up and then lived with the fact that they were complicit in a cover-up for half a century. Essentially, the defense, the defense introduced a counter-narrative wildly implausible, utterly groundless, that Reeves' colleagues had murdered him in the ambulance because the movement needed a martyr. That counter-narrative persisted in the minds of the white people of Selma. Sure, this band of white supremacist good old boys had roughed the ministers up a bit, but they hadn't killed them. So it was only right that people lied and covered up for them for all those years. To this day, most white people in Selma believe the lie, or at least they did at the beginning of the NPR investigation. The two rep reporters, Grace and Bradley, were able to debunk it 
They brought evidence to some of the people in town, and a few of them were able to let go of the lie after all this time. Others, including a former juror, clung to it like a lifeline and slammed the door in the reporters' faces. So there's a book that I read while I was on sabbatical. I've referenced it briefly in the past. It's called Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me, Why We Justify Foolish Beliefs, Bad Decisions, and Hurtful Acts. Here's the blurb on the back. <laughs> when we make mistakes, cling to outdated attitudes, or mistreat other people, we must calm the cognitive dissonance that jars our feelings of self-worth. And so, unconsciously, we create fictions that absolve us of responsibility, restoring our belief that we are smart, moral, and right, a belief that often keeps us on a course that is dumb, immoral, and wrong. See, it turns out, when we're faced with information that contradicts our beliefs, we go to extraordinary lengths to ignore or to credit, discredit it. In one experiment, people were hooked up to an MRI while they were exposed to both consonant and dissonant information, and the reasoning area of their brains literally shut down when the information didn't conform, they were being presented with, didn't conform to their existing understandings. They came back online, those reasoning areas, when consonants was restored. What does this mean? It means that we are far less rational than we like to think we are. When we are presented with data, facts, that would make us question the morality of our previous actions, we can't handle the cognitive dissonance, so we tend to reject any information that would make us question ourselves. And sometimes we cling to fictions that are demonstrably untrue, rather than facing the discomfort caused by accepting we did something wrong. This is true across identities. <coughs> and across the political spectrum. The theory of cognitive dissonance helps explain how the lies about the death of James Reed persisted all those years. It also explains, I think, a lot about the persistence and pervasiveness of racism. The belief that certain categories of people are inferior protects people from having to face the ways in which we automatically and subconsciously prioritize our own self-interest over the well-being and safety of others. So say you come from a family that historically owned slaves. To face that truth means accepting that your ancestors treated people like things. It's one thing once you're three or four generations removed. It's another when it's your grandparents who loved you and who you loved and looked up to. When you look at it this way, it kind of makes sense, although it's still unforgivable, but it kind of makes sense that white Southerners in the 60s overwhelmingly clung to the fiction that black people were inherently inferior. Recognizing the humanity and equality of people who your Nana and Pop Pop owned and treated horrifically would require tolerating a very high level of cognitive dissonance. Now, as I said, cognitive dissonance leads to confirmation bias across the full spectrum of political, religious, and social beliefs. We Unitarian Universalists love to tell the story of James Reeb, but the truth is that Reeb was the exception, not the rule. Or rather, he was on one end of the spectrum that included ministers who argued in favor, in favor of segregation on the other side of it. In the middle were a whole bunch of people who avoided talking about it at all, afraid of dividing their congregations. Only about 40 ministers, UU ministers, were brave enough to go to Selma following the death of Jimmy Jackson on Bloody Sunday. Reeb among them. The vast majority chose to stay home and stay safe. An honest and thorough assessment of our history reveals just as many stories that will break our hearts as stories that lift us up. It's a lot easier to focus on the stories that reinforce our existing sense of who we think we are and who we think our ancestors were. But when we back away from the discomfort of cognitive dissonance, we lose the opportunity to learn from the mistakes and the failings. And that's a tragedy. We have our own white lies. For example, anyone here believe that we live in a post-racial society? <laughs> Racism and other discriminations are an issue here in this very progressive community call Moscow. 
When we say all are welcome at the beginning of our church service, we, we gloss over the fact that we're still living into the space between normal hospitality that says all are welcome and here's how we do things here. <laughs> and the radical hospitality we aspire to that says, what do you need? What do you need to feel comfortable and at home here? We also gloss over the ways in which sometimes a, when a person behaves in ways that make others feel uncomfortable or unsafe, if they're not willing or able to shift their behavior, we do ask people to leave sometimes. So here are the comfortable truths graciously shared with us by people who carry historically marginalized identities. White supremacist heteropatriarchy is the water we swim in and the air we breathe. Our society and our faith community have a lot of work and a lot of learning to do around microaggressions and macroaggressions, both. This entire nation is built on the bodies and blood of slaves and the millions of indigenous people who were massacred during the European invasion, a genocide which, by the way, was larger by an order of magnitude than the Holocaust. 4,500 children have been separated from their families at the border. There are hardly any women who haven't been harassed, assaulted, or discriminated against because of their gender, and things are even worse for people who are trans or non-binary, and even worse still for people living with disabilities and mental illness. All of us exist in this fabric of identities that privilege and identities that put us in danger. And we haven't mastered how to use our privilege to protect those who are more vulnerable. We're working on it, but we have a long way to go. Now, it's not fun hearing these things, facing them, so we tell ourselves the biggest white lie of us. It's not us. It's not us. It's not me. It's them. People out there cause all the problems. But here's the thing, it's in us and it always will be. Even as we're advocating for laws that provide basic rights and protections for people who carry marginalized identities, we also, and always will, have our own work to do. Just yesterday, I said something sexist on my way to the human rights breakfast, no less. Just kind of popped out of my mouth. <laughs> And luckily I had somebody who was there who was like, <clears throat> and called me on it. You know, I, I had a party party and couldn't remember something. I'm not. I mean, it, 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 this is, it's who we are. You know, we make mistakes. We make mistakes. And the discomfort that we feel when we let go of our white lies, whether it's from cognitive dissonance or simple empathy when we must um, look suffering in the eye, it exists for a reason. We need to move toward it rather than away. We need to welcome it rather than walling ourselves off from anything we experience as dissonant or unpleasant. This takes an act of will. It takes focus and a willingness to question ourselves and our unconscious reactions and biases. These are the words of James Reeb himself, spoken in a sermon at All Souls in Washington, D.C in July of 1964, just months before he died. If you came this morning hoping to hear a message of hope, well, in many ways I will have to discourage you. There were many people who seemed to feel that once we had the March on Washington, once we'd had the Civil Rights Bill, things were just inevitably going to be easier, that somehow we'd done it. And I say to you only that I think this is the most dangerous kind of self-delusion, that we've not in any way done it. And that just to the extent that we think we have, we're going to be dismayed when we find out that we have not. And just to the extent that we permit ourselves to be emotionally dismayed, we ourselves as individuals will in some small way add to this thing that is known as the backlash, which is real. And I feel in many ways growing, and in many ways possibly stronger than we surmise as yet. 1964. And I could have written it yesterday. I written it yesterday. To the extent that we permit ourselves to be emotionally dismayed by how uncomfortable it is to look at racism and white supremacy in our society, we add to the backlash. To the extent that we permit ourselves to be emotionally dismayed by how uncomfortable it is 
at, to look at racism and white supremacy in our own hearts, minds, and spirits, we add to the backlash. The dismay that Reed references has in these times been labeled white fragility. In her best-selling book, Robin D'Angelo invites us to see our feelings of discomfort, cognitive dissonance, dismay as a doorway. She writes, we can use it as a door out, blame the messenger and disregard the message, or we can use it as a door in by asking, why does this unsettle me? What would it mean for me if this were true? How does this lens change my understanding of racial dynamics? How can my unease help reveal the unexamined assumptions I carry? Is it possible that because I am white, there are some racial dynamics I can't see? She writes, this is a white woman. Am I willing to consider that possibility? And if I am not willing to do so, then why not? She continues, to interrupt white fragility, we need to build our capacity to sustain the discomfort of not knowing the discomfort of being racially unmoored, the discomfort of racial humility. That's the end of the quote. Back to mistakes were made, the authors also offer some strategies for moving through the discomfort of cognitive dissonance. The first is to just name it as such, that this is cognitive dissonance. Then we can articulate the two beliefs or understandings that are at, at odds in tension with one another. Most importantly, we can normalize mistakes and accept that our failures and our missteps aren't signs of moral weakness, but rather an unavoidable part of being human. We can offer ourselves compassion, not in a superficial way, but at the end of an active and self-reflective struggle. When it comes to racism, to white fragility, D'Angelo asserts the white collective fundamentally hates blackness for what it reminds us of, that we are capable of and guilty of perpetrating immeasurable harm, and that our gains come through subjugation of others. Can we hold both the thought that we are capable and guilty of perpetrating immeasurable harm, and the thought that we are fundamentally good and kind and compassionate? Can we accept that our gains come through the subjugation of others and still be grateful for all that we have? And above all, are we willing to endure discomfort for the sake of the beloved community? For the end of the White Lives podcast, the reporters help one of the descendants of Elmer Cook meet with the descendants of James Reed. The conversation's a little awkward, a little painful, I felt uncomfortable listening, and I can only imagine the discomfort that Cook's great-granddaughter, Katie, felt. Yet she faced it. She moved toward it. She faced the truth of what and who she came from. In her words, it's really depressing, because obviously I have some of his DNA. Part of what made him him is what makes me me. She felt the discomfort, and she moved through it. And she connected with Leah Reed Varela and Anna Reed, who had who both offered forgiveness and grace. The first six episodes of the podcast were fascinating. This last episode, I cried my way through the whole thing. The two reporters, too, faced into their discomfort and their past. Both of them come from families that once owned slaves. Andrew Grace says, we look to the past for all sorts of reasons, to figure out how to separate ourselves from it, to find models for how to live, to better understand who we are, because while we don't have to be defined by the people in our past, they are buried in us. They are buried in us. And this is how it works. We have to face the facts of the past and the present. We have to endure, and not just endure, but welcome the discomfort. Building the beloved community isn't going to be fun and games and easy. It's not all love and laughter, because people, people are people. We make mistakes, we have blind spots, sometimes our brains shut down on us and betray us. We cause harm without intending to. This is just who we are. But we need to remember the goal. What are we aiming for, striving for, and enduring this discomfort for? I still see, I still dream of a world where all people are free and supported and expressing the fullness of who they are, the fullness of their creative potential. One of the requests made of us that I've been trying to honor is to read more books by people of color. Do you know how brilliant and beautiful, how much brilliant and beautiful work I've discovered as I've tried to honor that request and read authors of color instead of white?
write authors. Oh my gosh, science fiction that has challenged and changed me, poetry that's brought me to tears of joy, novels that have shifted my entire worldview, was all out there just waiting for me to turn toward it. This is true in art and music, dance and public policy. The more room we make at the center of our awareness for the brilliance previously relegated to the margins, the richer and more human we all become. Our places of discomfort are there to teach us. Like sandpaper, they polish us. They make us shiny so we can reflect the light better. The stories of suffering we learn and grapple with break us open in ways that allow us all to heal in truer and more loving ways. The cracks are where the light gets in. So break and shine, beloveds. Break and shine and stay in it. Embrace the truth, the pain, the gifts that abound in this journey we're all on together, moving slowly toward collective liberation. We've come a long way. We have a long way yet to go. And I thank all that is holy, that is all that is, that we are in this together. So be it, and so may it be.